Chris Darden. So. Okay, let's go ahead and go over the quiz. Um, I usually have everybody answer it once. Obviously, that won't work in here. So uh, I'll restate the question, and whoever thinks they've got an answer that works, hit the little microphone button. So what are the pressure conditions under which oxygen moves from the alveoli into the network of blood vessels surrounding the alveoli? Who's going to take it? Yes. Um, I put Henry's Law because gases diffuse from high pressure into low pressure, and the oxygen pressure in the alveoli is higher than the oxygen pressure in the bloodstream for the capillaries. Yeah, good. Any questions on that one? Okay. One for one. Well done. What's the physiological reason that narrow bronchial tubes are short? Yes. Efficiency of breathing, like for ease and efficiency of breathing, because the a shorter narrow tube is more efficient than a longer narrow tube. Yeah, anything you say about ease of breathing, efficiency of breathing, reduced resistance to airflow, all of that will be fine. Questions on that one? Okay. Uh, define resting expiratory level. Who's got that? Go ahead. The, op the opposing forces of the lungs and the thor when the, when the opposing forces of the lungs and the thorax are in equilibrium. Good. Equilibrium. When the opposing forces of the lungs and thorax or lungs and rib cage are equal. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this one can have a few different answers. Two advantages of instrumentation in clinical practice. Yeah. Okay, I put um, uh, precision mm -hmm. and um, validity, like validating your finding. I don't know. <laughs> You're fading into the sunset. Like, okay. <laughs> precision is a good start. To, to validate your... You have to go further than validate, like to validate your perceptual what you heard, impression, yeah, what you corroborate heard your perceptual the, right. impression. Okay. Because validate otherwise means something a little bit different. Okay. And, and precise, more precise interpretation of your findings. Okay. So it allows precision. What else does it do for you? Yeah. Wait, one, one back there first. Go ahead. Can you use it to compare with normative data? Good. You've got numbers to compare with normative data. Objective. It's objective rather than just your subjective impression. Um, allows for a pre and post assessment to check progress. You bet. Allows for kind of accountability, demonstrating pre and post assessment, pre and post treatment progress. Anything else on that? Yeah, I think those are the key ones. Uh, what physiological systems are active in the production of E? Somebody raise your hand. I know you all know this one. Go ahead. Respiration, the laryngeal, velopharyngeal, and uh, the articulatory. Otherwise known as all of them. All of them. Yes, <laughs> good. <laughs> if you wrote them out, that's great. If you just said all, that's fine too. Uh, what causes the parietal and visceral pleura to be linked together? Yeah. Okay, they absorb. Okay. <laughs> all right, here we go. <laughs> they absorb the fluid and the gases, which mm -hmm. causes negative pressure, which causes them to like. The, did you write down the <laughs> <laughs> absorbs the fluid and the gases causing negative pressure causing them to be sucked together that was a <laughs> okay questions on that one all right um, oh now this can be anything just about one observation you made of someone whose speech and voice were potentially beyond normal limits was it acceptable why or why not um, I work in a bar and oh work in a bar Star Wars bar scene, doesn't that come to mind? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> if I could play that song, I would every time, every night I work. Um, so um, this woman comes in. She has an unusual, loud and high-pitched voice. And Ooh. I've been working there for two years, and she's been coming in for two years. And, and it just penetrates through the noise of the bar? It does. And, it, it, yeah, and the reason I think it's, well, I'm not really sure why it's, it's not normal, like the physiology, and that's why I'm here. But um, other people have mentioned that she sounds annoying and loud. and she, Loud and high-pitched is like one of the worst combinations there is. Yeah, and I, I don't know if it's psychological or what the problem is, but hopefully Well, you I'll can't leap out. to psychological right away, even though it drives people crazy. You, you have to assume that it's a behavioral, functional problem. Uh, actors say it's a, it's a choice they made. Um, you know, in terms of how to portray themselves. 
So, yeah. Other ones? Yeah. Um, I worked at a speech clinic for about a year and a half, and one of the receptions, one of the receptionists that worked there, had a significantly noticeable lisp, and. Um, I found Speech reception to seal thyself. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I found myself listening to how she was saying the sounds instead of what she was You're saying. You're in the right field. That's and great. <laughs> and then I, I know that parents and other fellow coworkers would comment on how is she working here? How, why is she working at a speech clinic when she sounds like this? So it was obviously not normal speech. You picked up on how different it sounded. How different. That's yes. good. Very PC of you. <laughs> Yeah, she was challenged. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. During the election, like on CNN, they would bring in uh, Harry Belafonte, and he has a really is he like, still alive? Yeah, like <laughs> like he has a really raspy voice. Oh yeah. And it sounded like he was trying really hard to talk, and he would take forever to get through what he was trying to oh. say because his like his pacing and like the phrasing and stuff it was really? it was really slow i think but it was hard it well was hard what about his voice it. quality was his voice quality like horse yeah or it sounds like he's horse like, like he's, he's been smoking forever yeah or like he's been yelling all day or something or like he that. never knew how to sing but got away with crooning maybe so yeah <laughs> oh that's interesting there was another cnn one a woman who was commenting on the inaugural balls who had this gorgeous gorgeous dress and she dentalized every S, really close to a tongue thrust, really close to a lisp. And she was a uh, professor at Princeton. And I'm going, why didn't you ever fix that? It was, it was strange. But she looked great. So I suppose you can overlook the rest of it. Any other ones? Yeah. There's an um, elder at my parents' church, and whenever I visit them, like, he leads prayers often. And as he ends every utterance, his voice tightens. Oh, it tightens. And it almost... Huh. It, it gives the impression that he's about to break into tears. And he's not. That's just how he talks. And as he gets to the end of every... And I can't even imitate it. I've tried. And it, it almost just sort of draws up. And I don't know if he's running out of air. And he's it's trying exactly to get, what he's okay, doing. It's, yeah. It's, it's very distracting. Yeah. <laughs> that's that trade-off. As uh, We're going to go through the physiological systems kind of one by one. But there's a definite interaction between the respiratory system and the laryngeal system. And as you run out of air, if you want to keep on voicing, your laryngeal system has to tighten up. And the air starts eking out instead of being allowed to flow through open vocal folds. So, yeah, that, that makes sense. So you hear that a lot, and it does sort of have that emotional quality to it, but really they're just not breathing. <laughs> yeah, breathe, damn you, breathe. Yes, right. Yeah, they don't listen, though. Any questions overall on the format of the quiz? One down, you can drop the lowest. You guys all survived. That's good. All the other quizzes are going to be like this. Okay, sometimes there might be one that has a little bit longer answer, but basically they're all like this. The final will be all like this. Um, when you get to studying for the final, I'll encourage you to go over the quizzes, but don't assume that the same questions will be on the final. Um, it's just sort of to give you a jumping off point for what kinds of things to be thinking about. Okay? Yeah. Um, for the quizzes, uh, if you get like half of the question right, do you get half credit or you just don't get any credit? It kind of depends on the phrasing of it. Okay. It depends how close the half was. And I have had people complain in um, course evaluations that I'm really picky on the words that are considered to be correct in the quiz. But it's speech science, and different words mean completely different things. So there's a difference between pitch and fundamental frequency. There's a difference between volume and loudness and sound pressure level. And if you use the wrong one, it just changes the whole meaning of it. So be sure you, you're memorizing the right vocabulary. Uh, and it's, it's not what layperson's vocabulary is. I want you to all get away from concepts like volume is loudness. Because it's not. Volume is a volume of air in the lungs. Um, so just start shifting into a little bit more sciency mode. Okay? All right. Okay, let's get started then. We're going to talk today about um, pulmonary subdivisions. And when we first think of pulmonary subdivisions, these are uh, a breakdown of volumes of air within the lungs. So as we breathe in and out, and as we do certain respiratory maneuvers, um, we can get measures of different lung volumes. Okay, it's, and we'll, we'll go through that so it becomes a little bit more obvious in a second. We're, go ahead. I was just gonna ask you to repeat 
what you said? I'm not sure it was worth repeating. <laughs> really. No, nah, none of it, really. <laughs> we'll just plow on. It'll come more clear as we go along. Um, so the one thing I want you to keep in mind is we're still talking about uh, non-speech breathing. Okay, speech breathing is completely different. Everything changes when you start breathing for speech. Okay, so right now we're talking about the basic capabilities of the lungs to exchange air. And that's where the pulmonary volumes come in. <laughs> So when we talk about um, volumes related to the lungs, all of the volumes are measured in liters. Never caught on at the gas station, but they still use it for lung volumes. Okay, so everything's measured in liters. And you guys probably had this in like fifth grade or something, but people talk about smaller lung volumes in terms of cc's or cubic centimeters. So a thousand cc's is one liter. And when you get to bigger lung volumes, then they start talking about uh, like three liter lung volume, that sort of thing. We also use the concept of CCs in terms of airflow, how much air goes past a certain point in a given amount of time. And that's not me that can be measured in liters per second, which means there's tons of air going through. Usually it's measured in CCs per second. And we'll get to airflow uh, probably next time. So just have the basic concept of 1,000 cc's is a liter, and most of the lung volumes we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about in terms of uh, liter measurements. This is the old-fashioned way that people used to use to get uh, lung volumes. The test is the same, but the equipment that we use now is a little bit different uh, and much more streamlined. The testing to figure out uh, lung volumes and all the subdivisions uh, in a person's respiratory system is called pulmonary function testing. So if you're a speech pathologist and you really believe that uh, respiration is having an impact on your client's voice, and I have to tell you it hardly ever is, but if you believe that the actual volumes of air that they have to work with are limiting their speech production, you would refer the client for pulmonary function testing. So if you're in a hospital, you refer them to the pulmonary department, um, and a, a pulmonologist or even a respiratory therapist can get pulmonary function testing measures. All pulmonary function testing measures are obtained in exactly the same way. And they all look the same because of that. So you'll get used to seeing the squiggly lines that, um, that give us the pulmonary function tests. And the basic instructions are um, from a vital capacity maneuver. And this is a vital capacity maneuver where you breathe in as much as you possibly can and you blow out as quickly and as completely as you can. So if somebody talks about a vital capacity maneuver, they're doing pulmonary function testing, and these are the instructions that they give. Okay, and we'll do it today so you can see how it works. Basically, the person starts off by breathing quietly. Then when everything is stable and steady, you tell them to breathe in as much as they can, and then to blow out as quickly and as completely as they can. And you encourage them like a cheerleader to keep going and going and going. And you squeeze all the air out, and you start tightening up here if you want to talk. And they turn blue, and you go, that was terrific. <laughs> but you have to, when you're doing this, it's really not all that comfortable to breathe out as much as you possibly can. You know you can never, ever get all of the air out of your lungs, right? Why, why can you never empty the, your lungs completely? Plural linkage. Yeah, keeps them like that. Okay, so no matter how hard you try, you cannot eke out that last bit of air. But it feels like you are. So I did lots and lots of pulmonary function testing um, at the clinic I worked at with uh, people with traumatic brain injury. And they had a horrible time blowing out past resting expiratory level, that point where everything is in balance. At some point in the pulmonary function testing, you have to exhale beyond that. And all of their volumes down there that we'll talk about in a second, they were all way, way, way small. 
and they couldn't get themselves to do it. One of the problems with traumatic brain injury is you've trashed your frontal lobes, typically because of your brain swirling around in your head when you wreck the car, which is what most of them were. And frontal lobes are responsible for motivation and drive and getting you going, and they just didn't have them anymore. So I'd be doing my best little cheerleader routine, come on, keep going, go, 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 and they'd stop. So sometimes the values that we get may not really reflect the physiology of the person. You know, you have to kind of be sure they, they really followed the instructions as best they could. You may have to do it a few times. Somebody had a question. Yeah. Um, is that like the same device that they use for when someone has asthma and they're trying to check like their level of breathing or? When somebody has asthma and they're trying to check how they're breathing, they care about how fast air gets in and out. Um, and how fast is different from how much. So like a person with emphysema can have perfectly normal lung volumes, but can take a really, really long time to blow all the air out or to breathe in as much as they can. So um, what you care about with obstructive diseases like emphysema and asthma and bronchitis is how quickly can air move through the bronchial tubes. What we're measuring here is volume, usually, and usually we don't care about the speed. Okay, some tests tell us both, uh, but what we're interested in right now is volume. Okay, so if you picture lungs in different people, and again, I always think in extremes when I'm trying to figure things out. If you think about, for example, um, a child, and my example for all large things, Yao Ming, picture how their lungs are different and how these differences could affect their absolute or actual lung values, lung volumes. So what's the first thing you notice between Yao Ming and a child? Size, okay? Do you think that the bigger you are, the bigger your lungs are? Yeah. So size, particularly height, is going to have an impact on absolute lung volumes the actual measures that you get in volume. Okay, so one factor we know is size or height. Now think about uh, Yao Ming now and Yao Ming when he's 90. What do you think might happen to his lung volumes? Probably get lower when he's 90. All kinds of insidiously nasty things happen as you age. And some of them have an effect on lung volume. So we know that age is another factor. Okay, so we've got um, height, age. Now picture, um, well, no, no woman is going to be a comparable size to Yao Ming. Uh, picture uh, an average height man and an average height woman. Who do you think is going to have the bigger lung volumes? The man. Okay, gender wins. Men have bigger volumes than women do. So, so far we've got height, age and gender as being variables that can impact lung volume. On the gender, if it happens to be a small framed man, is it more because of body size or is it strictly gender? No, a small framed man is going to be more comparable to an average woman. So size is probably the prevailing characteristic. What else do you think might impact lung volumes? Yeah. Lifestyle, if they're a smoker, or maybe a non Yeah, I always hope that lifestyle would, and it, it doesn't quite as much as I would like. Smoking, again, doesn't reduce lung volumes itself. In the long, long, long term, smoking affects how quickly air can move in and out of your lungs. Um, what other lifestyle changes might have some impact on lung volume, though? Yeah. Athletes? Yep. Or where you live? Living higher altitudes, lower altitudes? Oh, okay. I, was, <laughs> I wasn't getting the where you live for a second. Um, Mountain climbers, not. Yeah, altitude can. Uh, that one's a little bit trickier and kind of esoteric because we don't study Sherpas all that much. Um, but go with the athletes for a second. So would you, what do you expect in terms of athlete, non-athlete? Athletes should have a larger lung volume. 
And they do for most part. It's again, one of those things that isn't as huge a difference as I would like. Which athletes do you think have the best lung volumes of all? Runners. Yeah, well, everybody says runners, and I used to think that, but I hear some hisses that makes me think somebody said swimmers too. What, okay, those of you who believe swimmers, why do you think swimmers would be better? Uh, because you're moving through water, so you're getting full resistance all over. That's, that's a lot of energy being used. Yeah, you have resistance to the actual displacement of breathing. So when you're trying to expand your rib cage, you're expanding against the resistance of water pushing against it. So swimmers win. So even marathoners, if you, if you compare a marathon swimmer to a marathon runner, the swimmer's gonna have better lung volumes. What about, um, what, okay, there's one other factor that can impact it. Again, not a huge, huge factor, but, but somewhat. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this would fit in lifestyle, but like working conditions, like miners and people who work in paper mills. Uh, working conditions. Again, uh, that's a good point. It's primarily, though, going to affect the junk that gets into your lungs. And when you have uh, particulate matter and stuff, all the horrible things that miners get in their lungs, that, again, is going to impact more the flow of air rather than the volume of air. Um, so it's kind of like the long-term smokers thing. Yeah. What about people that, I mean, where their bone structure is kind of not normal and they are hunched over? Yeah, that's the like old that. people fact. Yeah. <laughs> right, I'm gonna be horrible when I'm old. You bet. Okay. So, so general posture, uh, general bone configuration, uh, how, how you know, I always want to stand up straighter now, um, how, how erect you stand, yeah, yeah. Would um, weight go with size or would that be something? Not as much, height seems to be better than weight um, because height reflects more skeletal uh, configuration than weight necessarily does. Would pregnancy affect your... Oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor women in their ninth month. You get so short of breath. It's awful. So why, why does pregnancy have such a big impact on lung volumes? <laughs> wait, wait. I need some, one person to answer. It's chaos. Yeah. Because all of your organs are pushed up. <laughs> uh-huh. And, your... and the implications of all the organs being pushed up is what? Somebody raised their hand and hit the mic. Yeah. Diaphragm can't go down. Diaphragm and cannot go down. Cavity. Right. So you've eliminated one way to expand lung volumes. The diaphragm can't go down. So what are you left with to bring in air? Rib cage. Right. And that brings in some, certainly, but you really notice that lack of diaphragm going down. There's still one other thing. You've hit a bunch, though. How much, how much does like emotional stress play into it? Like if you're in, a do in the office and nerves and stuff like that. I think that affects um, one specific lung subdivision, mm -hmm. which is tidal volume, which is the amount of air that you exchange in a single cycle of breathing. So a lot of people classically, when they get nervous, they start breathing more shallowly. Um, but it doesn't affect your physiological capability. You know, the behavioral uh, impositions are different than your physiological abilities. Yeah. What about disease? I mean, Not a good thing. But I mean, would that affect the lung Yeah, volume? it depends which type. You know, again, like the minors and, and that sort of thing. Go ahead. Um. I'm not really sure if this is one, but I feel like when I eat a lot, it's harder for me to breathe in all the way sometimes. <laughs> this is a damn placement of the diaphragm, right? So if you eat a lot and your stomach's under there and it happens to be full, same old thing. Diaphragm can't go down. Yeah. So if you're having trouble breathing after you eat, you might want to lighten up a little bit. <laughs> okay. One thing I learned in the hospital was um, <laughs> your breathing is different um, when you're standing upright versus laying down. Yep. And um, it was something else I was going to say. I forgot. The, lung, the pulmonary Like when you're asleep, you, do, you have the best, um, I guess, 
breathing quality when you're asleep, like you breathe your best when you're asleep. Man, or my husband like sure that. doesn't. No. <laughs> Some people like laying breathe. down, I guess, I don't know what the difference is. There, there are advantages and disadvantages to each position. Um, and again, just for the validity of testing, like if you're trying to see if somebody improves over time, you, you certainly want to be sure that you test them in the same position. Most of the time, pulmonary function testing is done standing up. You have gravity working in your favor in terms of the diaphragm. Uh, standing tends to give you a bit better lung volumes because you don't have the weight of the rib cage that you have to elevate against gravity that you do when you're lying down. What about professions? There are certain professions that are associated with very high lung volumes. I didn't know if that would go kind of with athletes, but wind players, people who play wind instruments, singers, they're, uh, they're always taught to breathe from the diaphragm to pull that <coughs> down and so they increase the amount that they would maybe typically bring in. Mm -hmm. Professional classical singers in particular have uh, higher lung volumes compared to mere mortals. Yeah. Oh. I teach yoga too and it's all about increasing like when you breathe in you're supposed to bring a lot slow and steadily and it's amazing the difference that, that people that just start can do it and they have to do it like four long seconds and then when you get better you can do like eight and just keep yep. that throughout your class. Yep. And, and that shows too the effect of, of practice because just about everything can be improved on if you've done it a few times. So you get used to it, you get used to how it feels, you get used to how much you can push yourself. So yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Astronauts? Why? Uh, the intense training, the rigorous training they go through oh. before they get to enter space. Yeah, but I picture them mainly good. like runners. You know, I, I think they're, they're certainly superhuman in a lot of respects. Um, but I'm not sure how much that would be reflected in lung volumes unless they train with swimming. Okay, so what we've talked about are things that can make a difference in absolute lung volumes. When I measure someone on a spirometer and I get an absolute value of like three liters. You can't compare that across people. Okay, so that's not the way we look at lung volumes. Lung volumes are evaluated in terms of what you expect them to be for a person's, in particular, uh, age, height, and gender. Those are the factors that always go into predicting what you expect a person's lung volume to be. Age, height, and gender are the most critical ones. So that means if I compare the lung volumes of a kid with Yao Ming, they're going to be hugely different in terms of the absolute actual volume of air exchanged. But they may be exactly the same in terms of the percent of how much you predicted they would be. So if the little kid's in good shape, Yao Ming's in good shape, they could be 100% of what the equation predicted them to be. Okay, even though the little kids might be 1.5 liter, Yao Ming's might be seven liters. Okay, in terms of a predicted value, it kind of normalizes it and makes everybody equal. So that's how you want to think about lung volumes. Not the absolute, because that's affected by so many factors, but is it at the point of what you would expect it to be? What percent of predicted value is it? Okay. So that's why you'll see a column in all of the printouts of pulmonary function tests. You'll see a column that says this is the absolute value in liters and this is the value in terms of percent of predicted. Anything at 80% of predicted and beyond is considered okay. You start getting below 80% and you think something might be wrong. Okay, that's when pulmonologists start looking for diseases to see what might be going on that makes those pers that person's lung volumes uh, lower than we would expect. Making sense so far? Okay. 
So we have in the way we look at the respiratory system, we have what we call pulmonary subdivisions. We kind of divvy up the big maximum capacity of the lungs into a number of different uh, subvolumes or subdivisions. And this is an example of what a vital capacity curve looks like. So speech pathologists are very logical and always make inhalation go up. Okay, so whenever you see this kind of tracing, inhalation is up, exhalation goes down. For some reason, pulmonologists do the reverse of that. I will never understand why. Go with the speechy version, inhalation's up, exhalation's down. So what you have here is a graphic of a person breathing in and breathing out. That's a single cycle of breathing. Then they were told to breathe in as much as they possibly could and to blow out as quickly and as completely as they could and then go back to quiet breathing. Okay, that's what a classic trace looks like. So vital capacity is a measure that we care about, although you need to know that it rarely impacts speech. If you see someone with a vital capacity that is 70% of a predicted value, don't start thinking they're going to sound bad as a result. Okay, it, it's just not the case. Vital capacity is the maximal amount of air that we can exchange. So you measure peak inspiration way up here to peak expiration. And that's the person's vital capacity. So that's basically how much air can I get out of my lungs after I've breathed in as much as I possibly could. <clears throat> Tidal volume is completely different. Tidal volume is the amount of air that you exchange in a single cycle of breathing. Most of the time, we think of tidal volume as what you're breathing when you're just sitting quietly. Okay, you breathe in, you breathe out, you breathe in, you breathe out. You know you go down to the same point all the time. That's tidal volume. Technically, tidal volume can change quite a bit. So what's going to happen to your tidal volume if you've been breathing quietly and then all of a sudden you hop on a treadmill and start jogging? How does your breathing change? I see lots of gestures and I hear no microphones. <laughs> Someone be brave. How does your breathing change? Oh, God, it's a must do this. You're, you're walking, you're sitting, all of a sudden you sprint. Your breathing gets like, uh, more rapid like, and you breathe in and out faster and then in, in greater volume. Okay, so you, you speed up, that's one thing, but the key is that you breathe in more. Okay, so your breathing becomes bigger. If I were jogging on a treadmill, I would not be able to keep going if I just use the tidal volume that I use when I'm sitting still. Your body is using much, much more oxygen. You need to breathe in bigger to supply the muscles with that extra oxygen. Okay, you've placed co completely different demands on it. So while you can think of tidal volume as the quiet breathing, keep in mind that it's the amount of air that ex is exchanged in a single cycle of breathing no matter what. Okay, so it, it can change particularly with exercise, has a, a big impact on it. The other thing that can change tidal volume, which matters when we're trying to study people, is it's one of the first things to change when you put a mask on somebody to measure their breathing. If you put a mask on someone, all of a sudden they feel like they're breathing through a paper bag, and they start breathing bigger, resting expiratory level shifts, everything changes. So it's one of the things that makes it hard to get good measures uh, from people with a mask. Okay, so tidal volume and vital capacity are the two most basic subdivisions uh, within the lungs or the respiratory system. You okay on those two? Yeah. The light doesn't come on. For vital capacity, are you, you were saying it's the amount of air that exchanged from inhalation and exhalation. So 
for this picture, for example, is there more than one vital capacity or is there just Not one? Not in this one. In this one, um, this is the vital capacity maneuver that starts when you tell the person breathe in as much as you possibly can, breathe out as quickly and as completely as you can. But what I, when you talk about the air that's exchanged, you don't talk about it in both directions. You have to pick one limb of the maneuver. So that's why it's measured from peak inspiration to peak expiration. Same with tidal volume. If you're actually measuring it, you don't measure this one and then add this one to it. It's the air that goes in and out in a single cycle of breathing. Okay, so if I breathe in, <clears throat> excuse me, 300 cc's breathing quietly, and I breathe out 300 cc's, my tidal volume is 300 cc's, not 600. I've exchanged 300 cc's of air, okay? And it only matters when you measure it. Honestly and truly, you're going to get a printout of this that will keep everything really straight for you. But conceptually, it's important to realize that the air that you're exchanging in a single cycle is what the measurement's made of, okay? Other questions? All right. So now we get a little bit more esoteric. And these are the volumes that start to matter when we think about how your breathing changes when you're talking. Okay, these are volumes that start to come into play when we're speaking. So inspiratory reserve volume is this block here. And it kind of makes sense. I always try to figure out mnemonics. It's the amount of air that you can breathe in beyond what you usually breathe in for tidal breathing. Okay, so here's the peak of inspiration for a tidal volume. Inspiratory reserve volume goes from this peak inspiration of tidal volume all the way up to this peak of inspiration of the vital capacity. It's how much air you could breathe in in reserve. If you had to go beyond Tidal volume inspiration, how much more air could you get? Okay, that's inspiratory reserve volume. Now, you're going to find that this is where some of the terminology gets picky. There are differences between volumes and capacities when you're talking about subdivisions. So be sure you, you keep them straight right from the, from the beginning. Inspiratory reserve volume, you often see abbreviated as IRV. And it's what you can breathe in beyond typical tidal inspiration. Inspiratory capacity has a subtle difference. And inspiratory capacity is how much you can breathe in beyond resting expiratory level. So you notice this stable point right here that tidal volume always returns to. That's resting expiratory level. Lungs and thorax are in balance. You always go back to that point. Inspiratory capacity is measured from resting expiratory level, that point to which you always return, or the point of expiration of a tidal volume, all the way up to the peak inspiration of the vital capacity. So that's this block right here. Okay? Yeah. So there you really are adding that inspiratory reserve with the tidal volume. Exactly. And that's a really good thing to start doing. Start playing with the subdivisions and see what adds up to make different ones. So tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume gives you vi inspiratory capacity. Okay? Tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume is inspiratory capacity. So when you do a quiz on this, the easiest thing to do is draw a VC curve, label it all out, and you'll be able to figure out where everything is. Okay, it's one of those things that having the figure really helps. Okay? The next one is expiratory reserve volume. Now this one's kind of tricky because lay people have um, some odd conceptions about this. They have worse ones about residual volume, which we'll get to in a second. So just like inspiratory reserve volume was the amount of air that we could breathe in beyond the peak of tidal inspiration, expiratory reserve volume is the amount of air that we can exhale
beyond the peak of a tidal expiration. So from REL or resting expiratory level down. Okay? So expiratory reserve volume, it's what you can breathe out in reserve. It's what you breathe out beyond where you typically breathe out. This is the point I get to when I blow out all the air that I possibly can. So when you think about just jumping ahead a little bit to speech production, if I'm the kind of person who likes to keep on talking and dominate the floor and talk on one breath and never give a person a chance to jump in and speak with me and go like this and do a monologue forever and ever and ever, what volume am I going into? <laughs> expiratory reserve volume. So people who like monopolize are in expiratory reserve volume all the time. Okay, they just go on forever till they can eke nothing else out. Um, and it's a really weird pattern to see when you look at the volume uh, when, the, when they're speaking, the, this curve just goes on forever. It goes on forever, but there's a point beyond which you can't get. Residual volume is the air that cannot be exchanged even when I breathed out as much as I possibly could. So I'm ready to turn blue. I'm at my last, ga last gasp. You know there's still air in my lungs. The pleural linkage makes sure that my lungs are not collapsing at that point. That little bit of air that's always left in your lungs. I used to think when early on in my career, I used to think it was always the same little bit of air. It's not. It eventually gets breathed. Um, but when you breathe out maximally, the air that's left because of the pleural linkage is residual volume. How many of you have heard someone say, oh, she's talking on residual air? Maybe it only bugs me and maybe only I've heard it, but I have heard it. You can't talk on residual air. It's physiologically impossible to talk on air that you can't exchange. So people can talk well into expiratory reserve volume. They're not going to touch residual volume. Okay, that's just there. It might be exchanged in the next breath, but it is never going to be used for speech. The only way to measure residual volume is invasive. It, you have to do arterial blood gases, so, or you have to be in a, a full body plethysmograph, which is like the most claustrophobic thing on the planet. So you just sort of trust that it's there and don't measure it. Yeah? Is there um, residual volume in a collapsed lung? No. So if both of your lungs were collapsed, you would have no residual volume. You wouldn't be breathing really well, though. Okay, so we talked about some professions that have unusually large vital capacities. Studies have been done on highly trained classical singers who have larger vital capacities, and the way they have larger vital capacities is they've learned to essentially eke out more air to use to sing. So they have larger vital capacities because their residual volume is smaller. They've learned to get a little bit more out of the air that's left in their lungs. So what do you think limits lung volumes? If I'm a singer, and a classically trained singer, and I want to sing an aria that has a phrase in that's 20 seconds long, what's going to limit my ability to do that? What's constraining lung capacity? If I train for 20 years, and I swim for 20 years, am I ever going to be able to do a phrase like that? Some optimists are going, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> you're all, go ahead, you have a thought? Well, I was just going to say that if you're training and the diaphragm is, is getting stronger, I mean, I would just think that because the muscles are there to aid you in, in the breathing, then I would think that the muscles are just, just stronger to, in order to do that 
20 minute or whatever aria. <laughs> You're really good. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I will never have the size of chess that Yao Ming does. If he were trained, he could do the 20 second on one breath easily aria. You're always constrained by your skeleton, basically. You know, the rib cage is limiting. So I might have extremely flexible lungs. I might have lots of alveoli from being a Sherpa in the Himalayas. I might have really great inspiratory muscle strength because I'm a swimmer. And I still can't get past the rib cage. So when I breathe in as much as I possibly can, even if I'm in great shape, the rib cage, the, there's a point at which you can't get past the bones. So there are some physiological constraints. So how many really, really petite, tiny female classical singers do you know? They don't exist. Beverly Sills was a fairly substantial woman with a large rib cage. The really powerful singers have a lot of room to get in air. Olga Corbett, all the little petite gymnasts would make rotten classical singers. They're terrific, their lungs are great, but they don't have the basic capacity to do those long, long phrases. Yeah. I just went to see Mahler's Fourth Symphony last week, and I noticed that the soprano, um, you know, we were probably, we were on the orchestra level, but probably halfway back, and you can see, you know, her muscles just going crazy in her neck, and, you know, she was basically a block as far as shape goes. It was not very womanly curvy. She was just... Really? All I saw I saw that on Saturday, and I didn't think the, the soprano was that blocky. Maybe it was the dress. <laughs> Terrible outfit. <laughs> um, I didn't think she had a particularly strong voice, though. And it was a Mahler piece that had a lot of... It was Mahler, the first piece. One of them had a lot of notes where the singer was singing the same note as the orchestra, and you really just couldn't hear her as being different from the orchestra. Um, and her, her sustained notes were fine. She held them for a long time, but it wasn't really, really loud and powerful. She was like sort of second-tier opera singer. Um, I didn't think she looked like a block, though, so maybe her dress was better my night. Yeah. The same thing applies as in versus racehorses or long-distance horses. Arabians have very deep, deep chest. Greyhounds are the same way. Physically, they're just made mm -hmm. differently so that they can get the that larger capacity. So you have it in, in the animal world as well. <laughs> you bet. Quarter horses are built completely differently than thoroughbreds. Yeah. Yeah. So physiologic, physiology does play a role. People are sort of destined, you know, if you're really teeny and petite, everyone goes, oh, you should be a gymnast. If you have really great long, long limbs, people go, distant swimmer, go, you know, it, it's just sort of made for you. One thing I noticed about, like, uh, when you're listening to the radio to, you know, just random songs, um, I don't know if it's due to training or not, but I don't, it's not, it's not really good, I guess. It doesn't sound good when you hear, like, a singer inhale before oh, they. Oh, yeah. 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 Like, I've got some the great songs examples sounds better that. when it's actually yeah. silent. <laughs> they should have edited it out. We'll get to that when we get to the laryngeal system. There's one singer in, um, it's either the Killers or Jet, who does that all the time. Inspiratory strider when they're breathing in. Yeah. But it's not a respiratory problem. It's a laryngeal coordination problem. But it sounds awful no matter what. No, he's going <gasps> in between. Yeah, but they have to do like a lot of training in order to do Well, they got to learn to sing. <laughs> they sound great breathing out, but yeah. No, that's, that's, that's training. Okay, so here's the, um, a summary of lung volume relationships, and then I want to show you how we get the vital capacity curve. So this one, um, we've got here a few cycles of quiet breathing. So this is the tidal volume, air exchanged in a single cycle of quiet breathing. Breathe in as much as you possibly can. Whoops, breathe out as quickly and completely as you can. This is an illustration of tidal breathing changing. Okay, the amount of air that's exchanged in a single cycle. This would be an example of somebody uh, getting started on a treadmill and with, you know, every few seconds they start breathing bigger as the demands of uh, the muscles for oxygen increase. 
Residual volume is the amount of air that we're not going to touch down here. Uh, some people talk about FRC or functional residual capacity. I always thought it was the dumbest name because there's nothing functional about it. You can't get to that residual volume, so don't worry about that one. We've got inspiratory capacity going from end tidal expiration up to peak vital capacity. Uh, expiratory reserve volume going from end of the tidal expiration down to residual volume. Okay, so start playing around with those relationships. But what I did want to show you was how we actually get these. Um, and what I have is a, uh, a more modern version of uh, a respirometer. That spirometer was a really ungainly piece of equipment that uh, had an inverted tube. We'll see it in a video I think we'll show next time. It had an inverted uh, canister floating on water. And as air went into the canister, it went up and down, and it, the little up and down signal went to what was called a chymograph or a chart recorder. Just incredibly complicated. Now we can do it uh, with this, which is much, much easier. Don't worry about the terminology for this right now, uh, because we'll get to it next time. This is a device, though, that uh, integrates air flow to give us volume. So this is not measuring volume directly. It's taking all the air that's going through this device and integrating it and mathematically calculating volume. Okay. The point that I wanted to make, and I didn't want to take this across campus twice, is why I wanted to get to this. Every time you have a piece of instrumentation, the numbers you get will mean absolutely nothing unless you calibrate it. This is how you calibrate for lung volume. This is a, uh, a three liter syringe. When I was in grad school, we used to call it an elephant syringe. This has been calibrated and, and made specifically at a factory to contain three liters of air. So no matter what, I know that when I go like this, I'm exchanging, I know, good sound effects, right? Like that little whistle thing. Um, I know I'm exchanging three liters of air. So before I came to class, I hooked this up with the pneumatacograph, which is what this flow little measuring device is. And with the integrating device on, I put in three liters of air and I made sure the equipment knew that it was three liters of air that just went into this. Okay, so I have, an, I have things falling apart. I have a known volume going into my measuring device. And that's called calibration. If your equipment has not been calibrated, the values you get are absolutely meaningless. So as a clinician, if you're doing instrumentation, you have to be sure that you calibrate the equipment first. And a lot of people just skip that step and assume that it's okay, and it's really, really not. Okay? All right, so let's go for someone extreme here. Um, do we have any elite athletes among us? Do we have any former elite athletes among us? People are starting to point fingers. Wait, I know you do that. Anybody? No super jocks? <laughs> what do you do? Softball, I'm kind of wondering about in terms of aerobics. Volleyball is pretty good, though. You want to come up and give us a try? What? Oh, my God, what? <laughs> See what your lung capacity is. See, what I'd really like is an elite athlete compare with a smoking couch potato. Oh, no, no. You can't be both at once. That just won't work. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is get some basic data because... The software program needs information to give us that predicted value, right? If we don't tell it stuff like age, height, uh, it and gender, it won't be able to do anything. So, what's your name? Angela. Ooh, all caps for Angela. Birth date. 6-2-3-8-8. Okay, so I've got the birth date, so that's going to calculate age for us. Uh, female. We're going to take that as okay. And we've got your Caucasian. Where's that? It was back there. Okay. 
how high are, how how high are you? <laughs> Not very. How tall are you in inches? <laughs> Sixty. Sixty inches. Okay. Sixty-one inches. She's growing by the minute. Okay. Now I always choose petite people because it asks for weight. One ten. One ten. I think it was one ten in sixth grade, maybe. Okay. You a smoker? No. No. Good answer. Okay. So we've got age, height, weight, gender. Okay. That's going to give us some idea of mass. And we know that she works out. So um, we would expect her values to be fairly close to predicted for her age, height, weight, and gender, right? Okay. So there are two versions of the test that we can do. Uh, we're going to do the one that's called slow vital capacity because it gives you things in the logical order that we've been looking at. Okay. Now this is a little bit tricky because I'm going to ask her to put her mouth around this in a tight seal and breathe only through her mouth. If you're working with people who can't make a tight seal because of muscle weakness, you need to use a full face mask. Uh, if you're working with people who can't keep air from coming out of their nose, you need to use nose clips. We'll assume Angela can handle both of those. Um, so she's just going to put her uh, lips around this and breathe quietly once I start it. Normal breathing first, and then I will uh, ask you to do the maneuver. Now, it works better if you don't look at that. <laughs> Let me be sure this is on. It gives me this little prompt. Device is switched off, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I've done You've done it before. OK, so she's practiced. Because when I got values less than I thought I should, I did it a few more times until I got them where I thought they should be. No. <laughs> I'm waiting for the screen to change here. Okay, go ahead and just start breathing quietly. No, nothing major, regular old breathing. Small breaths. Okay, what we're waiting for is for that bottom line to go down to the, about the same point each time. Okay, whenever you're ready, breathe in as much as you can. Breathe in big, 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 big. Good, now blow it out. Blow, 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 blow. Keep going, keep going. Blow, blow, blow. Ah, no, 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 out. <laughs> what did I do? Oh, it was close enough. <laughs> no, 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 the slow wasn't it. Um, I wanted you to keep breathing out at that point. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, that's great. Look at these values. Okay, so she's kind of petite. So the predicted value was three liters. She produced 3.48, 114% of predicted. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Okay, do we have any smoking couch potatoes? <laughs> petite, little smoking couch potatoes. Okay, not petite, little smoking couch. No one's going to admit it, right? Would any of you admit to smoking? No, of course not. Would any of you admit to being a couch potato? Yes. Come. <laughs> That's okay. No, that's okay, because remember, asthma changes how fast you can exchange the air. But it shouldn't, it shouldn't affect the volume of air that you exchange. Oh, you're all bundled up. Okay, so we're going to get rid of that. We're going to start a new one. Okay, file, patience. <laughs> Okay, your name? Olivia. Birthday. Quiet, guys. Uh, October 28, 1986. 10. What was the 28? <coughs> yeah. 86. Female. Okay. Uh, height? Uh, 5 to 3, I think. 63. Weight? Uh, 145. Okay, you smoke? Okay, we're going to do the same one and see how Olivia does. Guys, I need quiet. All right. You saw what she did. Yeah. Test. Start. Just a second. No, wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay, now go. Don't look. Okay, so she's breathing quietly. There's inspiration. Just, just breathe. Regular breathing. 
Up is inspiration, down is expiration. Okay, whenever you're ready, breathe in as much as you possibly can. Huge breath in, big, 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 good. Now blow it out, blow, blow, blow. Keep going, keep going, blow more. Blow, 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 that's it. Breathe in, good. <laughs> that's the way you do it, all right. <laughs> It's really hard to do that in front of an audience. Oh, even for a couch potato. Look at that. She was supposed to be at 3.4 because she was taller. Uh, predicted value was, and she ended up at 3.66, 107% of predicted. So no one who's really feeble here. You guys have youth on your side. Oh, it's good. Yeah, right. No, I don't. No youth on my side. All right. Questions about any of that? The key things that I want you to understand are the factors that affect absolute lung volume. Okay, we know the main ones are age, height, gender. Okay, those are the biggies that will always be factored in to that equation that gives us the predicted value. So predicted value in terms of percent of what you expect a person to be is what matters. Okay, get comfortable with the lung volumes. Vital capacity is the maximum amount of air that we can exchange. Residual volume stays there unless your lungs are collapsed. We don't access it, even in a vital capacity maneuver. And then start picturing where a person's breathing for speech. If an opera singer knows they're going to sing a huge thing, they go well into inspiratory reserve volume, usually all the way up to the peak of their vital capacity and they may go all the way down to their end of um, peak expiration of the vital capacity in a very controlled and esoterically beautiful way. Okay? Any questions? Yes? You know how you said that both girls did well? What would be some, what would numbers would be bad? Like below the number? The numbers that would be bad, they were both above 100% of their predicted value. So what you would be worried about would be someone who was like at 80% of predicted or 75% of predicted. So instead of three liters, they could only do 2.5 liters. That's when you'd start to worry. Okay? All right. Have a good afternoon, guys.